Today's reading is from the book of Luke, chapter 10, verses 25 through to 42. Just then, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all, and with all your mind and your neighbour as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbour? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers, who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed on, passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while travelling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbour to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Now, as they were on their way, he entered a certain village, where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, and there is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. Hear the word of the Lord. Uh, we'd all like to hear those words spoken of us. Uh, Randall has chosen what is better. Uh, doesn't feel nice to hear our name in that sentence. Uh, if you want to try it, uh, maybe try it for yourself now. Kate has chosen what is better. <laughs> Trudy's chosen what is better. It, it feels nice when that is said of us. Uh, continually in life, we are presented with an opportunity to choose what is best. Uh, continually in life, we're presented with choices. Some of us like to uh, make decisions quickly just so the choices are out of their way and the, the way is clear. Uh, maybe you're someone that uh, when a decision has to be made, uh, you're a good person to come to because you'll make a quick uh, decision and it's usually a wise, fairly intelligent decision. Maybe you're someone that likes uh, to hide uh, your decisions away, put them off to the last moment until you just have to finally make a decision. Uh, I said earlier that uh, we've been clearing out a bit of a life stage of our house. Uh, there's boxes in our house that Katie and I have sort of hidden away for 10, 15, well, you know, 15 years. We've been married for almost 15 years and they've been sitting there all of this time and uh, yesterday and this two weeks that I've had off, some of the, the high points for me has been things walking out the door and I've almost had my hands lifted high in praise going, God, thank you that this is finally gone. Thank you, God, that this is finally getting sorted. Uh, I'm someone that will uh, want to do things right. Uh, or when you organize cupboards, I'm the person that organizes inside the cupboard. And I'll put off because I know that can be an overwhelming task. So I might put off a, a decision until the, the moment actually happens. Uh, but if you put everything in the cupboard 
and you shut the cupboard doors, even if it's not sorted, do you have to think about it? I'm sure you've all got cupboards and spots and drawers like that. Uh, in life, that's not always the best decision. It's just delaying actually having to deal with something. But sometimes the easier decision is delaying having to deal with something. Uh, we're, we're all continually uh, faced with choices to choose what is best. As more toys come in at Christmas, we have no choice other than to uh, move things out. So the choice is removed from us. But it feels good. It feels good once you've made the choice that you know you needed to make. Uh, I wonder for you, what, what defines your priority? What defines how you'll make a choice? Uh, what choice you'll make? What, what is the determining factor that will push you over the edge in terms of pressure to make a decision? What are the, the things that get in the way? Uh, the people of the law, so the, the Jewish leaders, who did, the lawyers would discuss the law and they'd say, well, this law is more important. This one is the one that should have priority. And so therefore, this one should sit over this law. And as a result, this is the most important law. Now, they thought that they were pretty smart. And in their wrestling and their thinking, they may not necessarily live out what they were talking about, but they would say, no, this is the most important thing. Uh, Jesus has been talking to his disciples, and you can join me on page 844 of the, the Red Bibles in the pews. Uh, Jesus has been talking to his disciples, and they've been going out, and they've been doing his mission, and they come back to him, and they're, they're talking about all that has happened, and he turns to them privately and says, Blessed are the eyes uh, that see what you see. So this is just before our passage, verse 23. Uh, For I tell you that many prophets and kings... You could insert lawyers desired to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. You see, these lawyers that would discuss uh, which commandment had the greatest priority in many ways were blind and deaf, did not see, understand, or let alone do. And so this is where we have Jesus telling the parable of the Good Samaritan. The, The lawyers here to try and catch up Jesus. Uh, In talking about the the different priorities, he wants to show that maybe Jesus isn't as smart as as he is coming across to the crowds, that actually the lawyer is the person of authority that people should be following as their rabbi. Uh, Turns out Jesus is a little bit smarter than him, and he tells this classic parable of the Good Samaritan. And in this uh, Good Samaritan parable, uh, we... he first asked, uh, what's, what's the greatest commandment? And he, rightly, Jesus says, uh, shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he, he says to him, you've given the right answer. Do this, and, and you will live. Uh, but the man wants to justify himself. And he asks Jesus, so who is my neighbor? And so he's wanting to catch Jesus, even if he hasn't caught him with the first thing. He's wanting to catch Jesus in in a place where he can again be shown to be the person that is smarter than Jesus. So when asked, who is my neighbor, Jesus replies uh, with the story of the Good Samaritan. And so I'm going to step through it very briefly. Uh, Verse 30, he says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Uh, There's key things to notice. Uh, The person was going from Jerusalem. It's likely a a, a Jewish person having spent time, and he's going to Jericho. Uh, He was going down. Uh, What does that mean? He was going down the hill. It was a downward trajectory from Jerusalem uh, over roughly 17 miles. And so this man's fallen into the hands of robbers. The robbers have stripped him, beat him, and they've gone away, leaving him half dead. Uh, So on the side of the road is this half-dead man, and three people encounter him. Uh, The first is a priest, uh, and notice here it says the priest was going down that road. So which direction was he going? He, He was not going to Jerusalem. He was going from Jerusalem. Why is that significant? Because it means that He actually didn't have a need to be ritually pure 
because he was about to attend service in the temple. Uh, So that need is removed, but he's the person who would likely have been in the temple and likely reminded people that this is the greatest commandment. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, with all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself. So this priest going down the road uh, walks on the other side of the other Jewish man who's lying beaten on the side of the road. Uh, the next person uh, we see uh, is, a, is a Levite. So someone that's been serving in the temple. So someone from the priestly line. Not a, not a priest, but someone who, who knows what it means to serve and follow God and knows the commandments of God. And he too walks on the opposite side of the road. Uh, verse 32, uh, so that's then verse 33, the Samaritan, uh, while traveling, comes near to him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. Now, this is really confronting for the, uh, the person that might be the priest or the Levite, let alone the, the lawyer, the Jewish lawyer, because they didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans were Jewish people who had married outside the the Jewish lineage. They were mixed race. They were outcasts. They were the the dogs. And neither of them liked each other. Neither of them would have been seen on the same side of the road. And yet the one that goes uh, across the other side is not the priest, not the Levite, but the Samaritan who should have never actually gone across the road according to the customs of the land. Uh, So this question, who is my neighbor, is could almost be summed up with a phrase, who who will I give help to? Who will I show mercy to? What kind of help will I give to another? And as as we think about this question, who will I give help to, uh, what we need to recognize is that us giving help to people is often uh, mixed with a whole bunch of barriers that get in the way socially politically economically religiously physically that might get in the way of us being a people who show mercy and help those in need uh, the a couple of days ago you know mangan street there's the dhs uh, my friend said oh you never guess where i am uh, who's trainee as a firefighter. I'm at Mangan Street. Well, there's 30 residences there. There's now none that can be lived in. Imagine if someone came running from there. Uh, The place is covered in graffiti and it smells and it smells of fire. Someone came running from there and you you saw them. You could see they're half burnt. Would you cross the road to help that person? That's a challenge. So think about the, the, the people that you might find difficult in life. Uh, would you cross the road to serve and help that person? Here, Jesus is presenting to us a, a thought that actually loving a neighbor isn't always an easy path to follow. Uh, often, loving a neighbor can come at personal cost. Uh, this man, the, the Samaritan, puts the... the the person up in the hotel and says, I'll cover the cost of whatever they need uh, when I return. Uh, He's more than willing to abundantly give over and above for someone that he should not be seen in public with. Have a thought to yourself. Who are the people that you would not want to be seen with? Who are the people that you find it difficult to be around? Imagine them not just sitting on the other side of the road, uh, beaten and broken and in need of help. Imagine them sitting on like one pure way. They're, they're that close. What are the thoughts that go through our head? Oh, they, they, they look in a pretty bad way, but, but I don't like them. I'm not sure if I want to help them out. That the thoughts that go through our head when we hit an opportunity to love are not always uh, easy thoughts to deal with. And yet Jesus is saying that the one that fills the commandments, the one who loves their neighbor, is one who's willing to cross the road for someone that they shouldn't be seen around. Who, who will I give help to? 
I think all of us at some level, if we're honest with ourselves, know that we would find it hard to help certain people. And it's really easy to put those decisions of helping people at a distance and not deal with them. But I think God wants us to wrestle with where we struggle to love. So who will I give help to? Now, the, the flip side of the story we often don't think about is, what if we were walking down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho? A priest walks past, a Levite walks past, and the Samaritan walks past. Who will we be willing to receive help from? Hmm. Who, who am I willing to receive help from? I, I think I have in my mind uh, certain people that I would tell when, when I need help. And certain people that I might not tell when I need help. But maybe, maybe in the middle of that, the wisdom of God is different from the wisdom of me. Uh, Think of that person that you would struggle to help on the other side of the road. Then think about them coming and crossing the road to help you in your moment of need. What does that look like? Jesus is challenging uh, the, the very understanding we have of who he calls us to help, and who he wants us to bring mercy to. Uh, the, the lawyer lives in a, in a law-based kind of world. Uh, which law has the priority? If I can sort all these laws into the right priority, then I can figure out which one I should fulfill, which one I don't have to fulfill, and therefore which decision I should make. Uh, the, the gospel of love that we find in Jesus Uh, causes us to make decisions differently, to begin to choose what is best, uh, not in a way that negates the law, but in a way that gives clarity that the law is never able to give. (laughs) When the law says love your neighbor and you're still trying to look through the laws to figure out what to do, you you may have missed the opportunity. So the question for us is how, how can I grow in understanding what is best? How can I grow in discerning uh, the priority? Uh, Let me tell you a story from a few years back. I was doing a ministry called Street Pastors. Uh, These may be people that you would not normally cross the road for. We would go out to Swan Street in the middle of the night and we would uh, go and give water, clean up the mess of, uh, make sure people got safely home, uh, nightclub people out there getting drunk, some on drugs, people that you may not necessarily feel comfortable crossing the road for, and that would feel like a sensible decision. Uh, this one night, uh, there was a couple walking down the street, and the, the girl who appeared quite young was leaning really heavily on the guy who didn't appear quite as young. Uh, she didn't seem to be so aware of where she was and so me and a couple of the other street pastors uh, went up to her and these are just everyday congregation members not pastors by that title that was just the title of the ministry and went up to her and we and him and said oh how are you going how's your night she was obviously unable to put together a coherent sentence and so as we're talking to the guy we're saying oh oh, how do you know her and discovered they just met in, in a bar and he said, oh, no, 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 I've been asked to, to take her home and asked a number, of series of questions. We even actually got him to show uh, his identity. And it got to the point where he was getting a little bit agitated and you could, you could see that he was not going to engage helpfully. And so we thought, okay, we'll just take a step back. What, what's best in that situation for us to take a step back and not escalate what was going on and just observe what was going on from a distance? And as we took a step back and observed what was going on from a distance, uh, I gathered the other group members together and we, we just said a little prayer. God, if, if this person is your vehicle for this girl getting home safely at the end of the night, then bless them, keep them, make sure they both get home safely. If he's not, Lord, get rid of him. Within 30 seconds, he hopped up from a table, walked across the road and we didn't see him again. We ended up being able to talk with the girl, uh, get her in a cab safely home uh, to, uh, once she'd sobered up a little bit, uh, to where she lived. In the middle of that, you could try and find a law that might be applicable. 
and you would very much struggle to discern what is the priority, what is best, uh, what to do. So in the middle of thinking about that, we have Jesus visiting Mary and Martha. Uh, Mary and Martha are, are ones who are thinking about what is best. Martha is great at hospitality. Amazing. I, I would want to go to Martha's house because I, I know she would serve me so well. She would love me with food and drink. It, Martha was a great person. I, I would have loved to be at her house and to enjoy the food and her hospitality. It would have been amazing. And Mary would have been sitting there and she wouldn't have been looking after my needs at all. <laughs> but Mary in this situation has chosen what is best. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And as she sits at the feet of Jesus, uh, she's said to have enjoyed what cannot be taken away from her. She's chosen what is best so when, when do i need to sit at jesus's feet uh, you you've probably uh, heard uh, a, a, where jesus talks about it's it's not the the healthy that need a doctor it's the sick that need a doctor i, I think a lot of the times in our christian faith as we think about uh, how we engage with Jesus, it's in the times where you and I feel like we don't measure up, we, we feel sick, uh, life's not going well, that we want to sit at Jesus' feet. Uh, I want to encourage you th this morning that actually the best decision we can make every day, the best decision we can make in every season and situation and before every decision in life, is to sit at Jesus' feet. Uh, to be a people that are willing to sit there and let him guide us in understanding what is best. You see, that place of understanding comes from understanding the one who loves us. Uh, one of the reasons that the, the priest and the, the Levite didn't cross the road is they, they didn't understand how to love. They understood the law, but that they didn't understand how to love. Uh, the greatest commandment that we hear here, uh, you, you'd know in John's gospel, is uh, upgraded. Uh, instead of saying, love your neighbor as you love yourself, which is often questionable because people don't always love themselves well, so how can they love their neighbors well? Uh, the commandment is upgraded to love your neighbor as you have been loved uh, so if the levite and the priest were to make a better decision what did they need to know in order to make a better decision in loving a neighbor they, they needed to know how they were loved where where do we discover how we are loved at jesus's feet sitting at the feet of the one who died for us loves us leads us reigns for us so when do I need to sit at Jesus' feet? All, all the time. You and I uh, need to be a people who are guided by Jesus and we discover his guidance sitting at his feet. Uh, why is that position of, of sitting at his feet really significant? Uh, th think of the, the, the teacher and the children sitting on the floor. Uh, the, the natural position of someone being higher and someone being lower sitting at jesus feet is one of humility and so when i come and i sit at jesus feet it's me saying actually i, I have ideas about what is best and i have plans in my heart but i know lord that you're the one that determines my steps you're the one that guides me and i want you to guide me in your ways so you're not dragging me back off my ways so lord lead me as i sit on your feet be my lord so, so how how do we sit at the feet of jesus well uh, it looks like us being a, a people of prayer it's the simple things uh, I, I wonder are you good at starting your day as a person of prayer sitting at jesus's feet and going god what what do you want to draw my attention to as your priorities for today. I've got an agenda, it's busy, it's full. Uh, 
in those moments before a busy or stressful meeting, saying, God, help me to know with clarity the way. As you're in the middle of study and, and struggling to understand a concept, uh, God, help me to understand. But then not just prayer. Sitting at Jesus' feet looks like being taught by him. Uh, Mary would have sat there and uh, heard Jesus teaching on different topics. And so we need to sit under Scripture and, and read the Word of God and let it shape and govern us. It's When we look at choosing what is best, the, the Christian life is at one level really simple and then at another level really hard, <laughs> full of life with choices that are not easy full of challenges with choices that are not easy, full of burdens that we didn't necessarily choose where we need to respond in ways that aren't always easy. And knowing that we have someone that actually wants to help us choose what is best in any and every situation. I spoke on New Year's Eve about 2024 being a, a year to live differently. We can reflect back on 2023 and see where our choices have left us and where our choices have led us. If you want 2024 to be a different year, let me encourage you, let it be a year of learning to sit at Jesus' feet here on a Sunday, at home on a Monday, at work in your lunchtime, as you walk, learning to be a heart that is positioned before Jesus in order that he will guide you to choose what is best. Next week, we're going to talk more around what is best. Uh, but the, the question of decision for us is, am I going to be a person that chooses to sit at the feet of Jesus and receive uh, all that he has for me and then be led by him as he directs me?